Welcome back, Mitochondria Access. Dr. P. Lord for another episode of Cancer as a Mitochondrial Metabolic Disease. So we're going to continue our micro series into melatonin. And in the last video, we left off on this slide talking about melatonin's important roles for affecting not only the central clock, but the peripheral clock and the peripheral clock genes. And we left off kind of with the idea that melatonin is only made in the pineal gland, which is a big misconception and has been debunked thoroughly. And as a matter of fact, probably the majority of the melatonin is made outside the pineal gland, which is interesting. So this is a diagram of how melatonin is created in every single mitochondria. And this was discovered not too long ago. And what they found was every mitochondria is able to take acetyl-CoA, which you'll see in the next slide, and convert it to 5-HT or serotonin. And then through a, a variety of enzymatic steps, this AANAT and this ASMT enzymes, you're able to convert serotonin into melatonin. And interestingly enough, it's going to have several intracellular and extracellular effects. So as you can see here in this diagram, you're going to see that melatonin is going to exit the mitochondria and have direct genomic effects on the nucleus. It's going to act as a exceedingly powerful antioxidant. And it's going to then feed back onto the mitochondria itself to affect various mitochondrial processes. It can even exit the cell, act on the same cell that it left, which is called an autocrine effect, or affect adjacent cells in a paracrine effect. Pretty interesting. And this is just a, another representation, a little bit deeper representation of the biochemistry underneath all of that. So you have pyruvate. We've talked about that several times in the past when talking about cancer and glycolysis and energy metabolism, et cetera. And that's going to get converted into acetyl-CoA through this PDH enzyme or pyruvate dehydrogenase. And then acetyl-CoA is, is going to help in the conversion of 5-HT to this NAS intermediate and then subsequently get converted to melatonin. And just so we have it out of the way, AANAT stands for our alkalamine in acetyltransferase, or it's also known as serotonin in acetyltransferase. And then the ASMT is known as acetylserotonin methyltransferase. And then of course, melatonin is going to have its various actions that we'll talk about in nauseating detail in the future. And I'm going to take us back to the light story because this becomes incredibly important when talking about melatonin also. You know, we talked about this a little bit during the vitamin D series, when we were talking about UVB exposure to create the cholecalciferol molecule from 7-dihydrocholesterol. But in this story, we're going to be looking at both the near-infrared as well as the UV. And if you remember right, the solar spectrum, and this is a kind of a perfect solar spectrum at noon, but you have UV, you have the visible light spectrum, and then you have all of this infrared, and it's going to be broken down into near mid and far infrared. And that's exactly what it shows here. And you're going to see that estimated 52% of all solar spectrum is the near infrared. And how does that tie into melatonin? Well, it ties in twofold. So it's fairly well known at this point that blue light from various sources at night through the signaling of melanopsin, remember this slide here, when light hits the back of your eye. Now imagine, although this is the main signal, you have melanopsin all over your body inside blood vessels, et cetera. So you really can't escape blue light by wearing blue blocking glasses, although I do think it's a powerful intervention. So when you're exposed to, let's say, LEDs, which has a giant spike in blue, you're going to have an 80% suppression of your melatonin at night. If you're exposed to complex fluorescence or any fluorescent lights that have spikes that look like this of blue and green, 80%. Incandescence, the lights that they banned because of energy inefficiency, only has a 40% decrease in melatonin. Candles have a negligible 2%. And then there are special LED lights that are made by various companies that also have very little effect on melatonin production because they are essentially red in color and they have nothing less than about 600 nanometers. I know this particular spectrum is talking about having some green and blue, but some of the lights that I'm talking about literally have no, nothing but red. So the reason I bring that up about the light spectrums is twofold. Number one, it's been shown that UV radiation or UVB will increase your body's production of melatonin. And as a matter of fact, and we're going to talk about these at length, but some of the major melatonin metabolites, 6-hydroxymelatonin, this AFMK, 2-hydroxymelatonin, 4-hydroxymelatonin, these are all intermediates that can be found in these skin cells and also in the urine of patients who are exposed to UV radiation, which is pretty cool. The question is, and it's an open-ended question that no one knows at this point, is how much of the melatonin is from UV? That is an open-ended question. Because in 2023, Scott Zimmerman 
and Russell Reeder, one of the most well-known melatonin researchers in the world, came up with a study. And if anybody knows Scott Zimmerman, he's a light engineer. And they came up with the study and they found that not only is mitochondria making melatonin, but it's making melatonin in giant quantities under sun exposure. And their hypothesis is, is that it is the near infrared spectrum that makes up 52% of sunlight is what's responsible for making this giant amount of melatonin possible. And they have proposed a mechanism where we have either red or near infrared light signaling to essentially not only increase the expression of the enzymes responsible for melatonin conversion, but also for the stabilization of those enzymes through various chemical pathways so that you are able to maximize melatonin production. And I think that this is one of the coolest slides that I'll probably ever present to you because basically what they found was they, they and this is plasma melatonin, this is blood level melatonin, which is thought to be only found via pineal release at night under good circumstances, AKA no light at night. And they found that there was a giant spike in melatonin production when the person was outside under sunlight and they were doing exercise. Now, as you can see here, it reached a quick spike up to about 220 picograms per milliliter, which is, if you compare that to the max amount measured at night, that's 60 picograms per milliliter. We're talking about a more than threefold increase in melatonin, just sheer quantity over the circadian melatonin production. And although this was an amazing study and it really furthered, you know, how important sun exposure is, it really, I think, fell short in some ways because first of all, remember 52% of sun is infrared A or near infrared. And you'd have to assume, and really in science, you don't really wanna assume that at nine o'clock in the morning, nine o'clock, 10 o'clock in the morning, depending on a lot of factors, right? Depending on if it's winter, depending on what latitude you're at, depending on a lot of things, is this all secondary to or from the effects of near infrared light? Or is it green? Is it red? Is it ultraviolet? We don't really know. The only thing I could say to try to elucidate whether or not this is infrared or not is because at this time of day, the UVB will be almost non-existent most places in the world. UVB is not gonna be showing up till 10 to about two o'clock in the afternoon. And you can see there's not a much bigger spike after that happens. So my guess is, is that the majority is from infrared. And then there is some additional benefit given from exposure to UV in the afternoon on melatonin. And that accounts for this rise. Now, the other variable that has not been accounted for is exercise. I personally have not seen any data to suggest that exercise increases melatonin. So I don't know why they just didn't have them sit outside in the sun for four hours instead of exercising outside for four hours. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I'm not exercising for four hours. So, I mean, I don't know who's even able to do that. The only thing I can think of to kind of put myself at ease here is that, you know, you could, the spike is essentially immediate upon exposure and initiation of exercise. So, you know, you're going to, even if you were able to only do 20 minutes, you know, you're going to get a giant spike take a break, 20 minutes, do another spike, you know, you're going to get a lot of these benefits by just being exposed in general and potentially exercise. So still a lot of questions here, but the bottom line is, is that melatonin is made in gigantic quantities when you're exposed to natural sunlight, probably more as a gestalt and potentially due to exercise. So it just shows the continued health importance of those interventions. And, you know, hopefully God willing in the future, they can take like a, an infrared panel you know, like an EMR tech or something that has a very specific wavelength, 670, 850, et cetera, and look at these melatonin levels and then take something like maybe one of the sauna space, you know, full spectrum bulbs that they have. And that's going to have essentially this spectrum right here. And you'd say, okay, well, is it a broad based effect? You know, what happens when you take a broad based near infrared versus a very particular wavelength, like 850 nanometers. Those are the questions that still need to be answered. And then the other question is, I, I would like to have answered is, is, does exercise increase melatonin? And how much melatonin is created just under UV? Because this study is looking at just isolated UV radiation. And we don't know what that looks like when it's either measured in terms of how much is being raised in the plasma levels, or is there a synergistic effect between infrared and, and UV? And my guess is that there probably is.
So I hope this answers some of the questions that I've got in the comments about, you know, how to maximize melatonin production. And I've also got a question about does melatonin interfere somehow with vitamin D? And you're going to see in the next video that that is not the case. And it really can't be the case if you're making melatonin in your skin via UV radiation and infrared radiation during the day, and you're making vitamin D at the exact same time, there's no way that there can be any contradiction there, which just shows that there's a beautiful symphony going on underneath the skin, pun intended, biochemically, when outside in nature. If you like videos like this, please like, share, subscribe, and until next time.